Alrighty, welcome back to our or Planet of the Daleks. We're gonna continue this commentary. Let me just back it up a little bit and Alright, we are going to start in three, two, one. So, uh continuing from last time we're watching Planet of the Daleks, which is one of my favorite guilty pleasure episodes. And this is something that I didn't really touch on last time, but I wanted to talk about how I'm sort of like, I'm sort of full of contradictions when it comes to my favorites, because my favorite doctor is the third doctor, but Joe is one of my, uh, she's lower on the totem pole than most other companions. And my favorite enemies, my favorite villains are the Daleks, but they don't work well with Pertwee's doctor. Um, I don't know if it's just the imagery of having this, like, James Bond type, uh, doc doctor with, um, with these sort of weird space aliens, uh, you know, and they're in their weird sort of tank uh, suits, whatever. It's just sort of a big contrast that, despite him being my favorite doctor, and despite the dogs being my favorite villains, they do not work together at all. And I like this here, um, how the Daleks, they have the ability to turn invisible now, but they keep having to experiment with it because it drives them mad whenever they go, whenever they make these special types of Daleks that can turn invisible. And that is similar to how the special weapons Daleks, as seen in Remembrance of the Daleks, even though they're a very powerful design of Dalek, not every Dalek is a special weapons Dalek because they go insane. You know, they're not very practical at all. And so I like that, that even though the Daleks are keep- they're ingenuitive and they keep coming up with ways to kill things. Um, it, it's, um, it's just interesting uh, uh, to see, like, the different types of improvements the Daleks make, but can't widely or massly apply yet due to it having severe um, drawbacks, like invisibility, which apparently gives them, I think it was like solar radiation madness or something, the Thals mentioned it just there. Um, so yeah, I very, I very much do enjoy that, and I like it when the Daleks are more scientific and when they're like planning on stuff, you know, sort of trying to come up with new ways uh, to conquer the universe. Because that's what the Daleks are all about, really. It's all about new ways to kill things, new ways to exterminate. And my favorite Dalek stories are the ones where they're more inventive, where they're coming up with unique ways to th uh, operate, you know. Um, however, I say that, and Planet of the Daleks, one of its biggest weaknesses is, is, as I said last time, the invisibility is only used in that one cliffhanger shot right there, just to reveal that the Daleks are here, even though if you've seen Frontier in Space, which you likely have going into this, you already know that. Uh, one of, um, one of the complaints I've seen about this episode is that the Thal characters are very shallow, and I do agree with that. However, there are enough of them to make it interesting, and there's enough of them to the point where when they die, you're like, oh shit, you know. Um, <laughs> that's one less like supporting character that we've got here. And they are pretty much just here for cannon fodder, except for the ones like Rebek and Taran and Weber, who sort of a lot of the uh, plot um, orbits around. Uh, you know, and I would say Terran actually goes through character development throughout this, uh, serial. Whereas the other Thals are very, um, they're very one note, uh, very static. And I do like that MO that's very uh, constant, um, especially in classic Who Dalek stories where, you know, the Daleks will 
introduce a plague or something to a planet they want to invade and then come in and start killing shit and subjugating shit when it's weak, you know, when it can't do much. Which is a holdover from the Dalek invasion of Earth and watching this serial, as some of you guys might know, um, it, it Planet of the Daleks is sort of like a best hits of the Daleks. It's basically a retelling of the original Dalek serial with elements from Dalek Invasion thrown in, um, elements from uh, all sorts of different Dalek stories uh, thrown in there. Um, and like you'll see beat for beat, this sort of does align with the original Daleks serial. I mean, even like you can compare individual episodes of both serials and they line up pretty well. There's even a scene in this where, like, they're going up some sort of shaft. I think it's like a heat exhaust shaft or something like that. And they're going up, and they, the Daleks uh, levitating after them, and they throw rocks down to smash the Dalek. And that is that that's almost a direct shot uh, repeat of something that happens in the original serial, where Ian, Barbara, and the Doctor throw a statue down an elevator shaft to stop the Daleks from following them up. I love this is a um, this episode's a bit of a quote factory for John Pertwee. Um, you know he's got his famous uh, "Courage is more than just not being frightened" line is in this serial, and he has another he has a few other key moments. He has a speech near the end where he's like, "Don't glorify war, you know. Go back. Don't tell don't tell the people. Don't tell the Thals like." Oh, you know, it was glorious. We had this big takeover of the Daleks. Don't tell them that. Tell them that people died and it sucked and you managed to, you know, stumble your way through. Uh, and that's a very strong John Pertwee speech. John Pertwee, he's a very strong uh, actor. You know, he's... Which is very interesting because before he was the Doctor, he was a comedy actor. He did radio comedy stuff. Um, and even after he was the Doctor, he played, like, Warzel Grummage, and he was on, um, I think he hosted Who Done It or a talk show like that. It was, like, a game show, I should say. You know, and he was just a very comedic person in everything he did except for Doctor Who. Look, I love how you can just... It's a very simple effect where you just move the bushes uh, to symbolize, like, something moving through there. It happens, it's another thing in, like, Jurassic Park as well, especially Jurassic Park 2, where they just move the grass, and it's like, oh, the raptors are in there. And it's nice, and it's like, obviously they do it here to symbolize the uh, invisible creatures, uh, the spiridons that uh, inhabit this planet, like, moving around. But it's so much nicer than, like, having a predator visual. You know, something like that, where you can see the light sort of reflecting a bit off of it. Um, whereas, if you do it like this, if you just do it with practical effects, it looks so much more real. And so much more interesting. One of the things I like about the old Dalek designs, um, especially, like, one of the things is they were not, uh, CGI. You know, like, I'm pretty sure almost every Dalek in the new show is CGI, and I'm a big fan of practical effects. So, ha seeing, having the actual Dalek models there is, it's just nice to see them, like, move about, and I love how they sort of glide. You know, in the new show, they move like machines, where it's like, and they, they like rotate very stubbornly and all this shit. But in Classic Who, they just, they, they push them around a little bit. They glide over the sets, and they move all very realistically. Uh, and I like them so much.
Even though, like, the, I mean, the new, new, new Hudaliks are damn near indestructible. That's one of my favorite things about them. It's so easy to kill Daleks in the classic show. You can kill them with, like, a baseball bat. You can just, like, push them a little bit and they'll die. My favorite example of a Dalek dying to stupid bullshit is in Death to the Daleks, where a bunch of primitives just club it to death and it just explodes. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck? What? <laughs> um... So yeah, one of the biggest pluses to the new Who Daleks is that they aren't useless. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to call classic Who Daleks useless because they're they're scary. Obviously, uh, they were scary at the time, and still in many ways are now. Especially like little children. Like if you if you throw classic Who on with like children around, they're gonna be scared of the fucking Daleks. Also, do find it interesting how these Daleks basically had the ability to completely obliterate a spaceship, which is something that not every Dalek has, you know? That's another thing in Classic Who. The power levels are very... It, it's like... It's sort of unrealistic, you know, sort of how powerful things are. And it's most evident in stories like Robot, where apparently Unit just owns a gun that can drill a hole in the moon from London, and it never comes up again, and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> what is... like, what's, what, what do you even do at that point, you know? Why has that never been brought up again? Um, yeah, some things in Classic Who are, like, unrealistically powerful. Um, but it makes sense in, like, Remembrance of the Dalek, where you have a specifically powerful Dalek, the Special Weapons Dalek, can just, like, level buildings, and that makes sense, because it has a special weapon to do that with. Um, but that special weapon also drives it insane, you know. It's sort of having power, but having drawbacks as well, which is something that, at times, Classic Who does really well, and at other times, does terribly at <laughs> Who is Kotal? Okay, that's that's this uh, Thal. I'm still. It's it's sort of hard to remember like all the Thal character names because they there's so many of them and so many of them die. It's hard to keep track of, and they all look alike. Which I know I said like it was a bit of a plus in the first episode. Not not really. I just I drew attention to it as like uh, explaining the differences between aliens and humans, even though some aliens look a lot like humans. Here, we're about to have, um, about to have a very famous perch we quote come up here. He's a very, he, he gives you, like, some nice pep talks. God, I love Pertwee. He's just the best doctor. This also has direct parallels, like, Terry Nation wasn't known to really write, uh, stories about, like, very big, uh, real-world stuff. Like, he wrote about the Nazis, obviously, because the Daleks are the Nazis. And you can tell that Terry Nation must have had a pretty, uh, keen understanding of World War II, just from the way that he writes them and the way that he has the Daleks interact um, and sort of how they conduct their plans. So you can tell that he has a, a pretty good understanding of that stuff, but who really usually blew it out of the park with, uh, having real-world material, uh, and then just writing stories about shit that annoyed him in the real world was Robert Holmes. And Robert Holmes, oh, I want to do a video essay on him, because that man basically made Doctor Who. You know, he made it what it is now, um, and he does not get nearly enough credit for it. I think most of that's due because his first two stories are really bad and his last two stories are really bad. But those are the only bad stories he ever wrote. Every else, everything else he touched was basically gold. Here we, a lot of people, um, 
like when they think about Persuis Sonic Screwdriver, they remember the one with like the weird traffic cone, uh, yellow and black stripes and shit on it. They don't remember the fact that for at least two or three seasons, Pertwee actually used the one that's most commonly associated with Tom Baker, which is the sleek silver one with the red, uh, the red, uh, like, circle and the, the silver bullet and all that. You know, most people remember that and just associate it with Tom Baker, and every time they think about Pertwee's Sonic Screwdriver, they remember the one with the weird, like, construction symbols and stuff on it. It is actually ironic because <laughs> Pertwee, um, Pertwee used that silver sleek sonic screwdriver quite a lot. Here we are with another, uh, f uh, uh, the only actual Spyridon character in the story. Because the other ones, they're sort of just nameless slaves of the Daleks, but Wester's a proper character. And I do like, uh, he's, he's acted very nicely. Like, it's almost as if he's there in the room. And he probably, they probably had an actor with some sort of, like, green screen shit on for most of his scenes. But, like, just the way he's acted and the way that the other characters interact with him, uh, it's just very interesting. Especially for, like, a 70s low-budget sci-fi show. I, <laughs> I find it hilarious that um, Joe and the Doctor are both surprised to see the Daleks here, even though the Doctor specifically called the Time Lords and was like, "Hey, I want you to track those Daleks. I want you to bring me, bring me where they're going." And then both of these characters, like Joe, obviously, she might have had some. You might have some leeway there, saying, "Well, Joe didn't really know. That's what the Doctor said." But like, the Doctor has no reason to be surprised to see Daleks on the fucking planet that he was like, hey, it's Time Lord, send me to the Dalek place. You know, he, he has no reason to be surprised there. That's just a funny little observation, though. <laughs> I, very, I, I love, um... I love that the Doctor sort of, like, pulls out all the stops, you know, like, he he knows everything about the Daleks at this point, and he's not afraid to just jury-rig some shit together, like, he's confident, he knows what he's doing. He turns a goddamn, like, cassette recorder into a weapon to immobilize a Dalek. Um, and on one hand, it's really cool to see the Doctor, especially Pertwee's Doctor was known for, like, MacGyvering his way through situations and making shit up on the fly, like, just making machines to deal with the problem. Uh, that was, like, one of the biggest things Pertwee's Doctor specifically was known for. But, um, especially in this story, since he does it so often and he knows so much about the Daleks, he knows every single one of their weaknesses, it makes them a lot less threatening than they should have been. Well, another thing in the, uh, classic Who Dalek... Uh, stories was that whenever they're talking the lights barely ever sync up with what they're saying you know whereas in the new show they're pretty good at syncing those things up yes this um this serial purports having what i like to call a monster clock as well which is where you have a set amount of monsters that you know you've got to deal with and the most in my opinion, like, the, the uh, best example of this and the movie that actually inspired me to invent the term monster clock was Tremors. Because in Tremors, you've got four monsters, and you can tell how far through the story you are uh, just by counting down how many are left. And, you know, shortly after the last one dies, that's when the movie ends. So that's why I kind of call it a monster clock. And I like just having... There's something interesting about having a set number of things that you've got to deal with. And every time you've got to deal with them in a new way. And that's what Tremors does so well. I'll do a commentary track on Tremors eventually. I shouldn't even be talking about it right now. 
Here we go. The famous, um, famous subordinate betrays commander scene, which happens a lot in Classic Who. Vaber thinks he's being, he wants to be heroic, you know, he doesn't really care too much. He's doing what he thinks is gonna get him in the history books, you know. Uh, though in the end, he does sacrifice himself for his friends. But right now, he's basically just being a little selfish. And that's um, one of the things I like most about Weber's character. Is that he's not just a standard military guy. You know, he's gonna fight with Terra and he's gonna uh, try and... Like, rebel, he's gonna try to get his glory. And here we are. I think this is like the primary example of Pertwee Jerry rigging something together to deal with the Daleks in the story. And here we are, a famous callback to the invasion methods used by the Dalek and Daleks in previous stories, where they just bombard a planet with uh, poison or plague, and the inhabitants sort of have to adapt. And even if they do adapt, you know, the Dalek invasion force then comes down and subjugates them. Even though invisibility is never, <laughs> never brought up ever again, Lester. Uh, other than in the case of the Spiridons. You can see them, like, shaking the plant there. I don't, what was the point of that? Because I don't think Wester's moving here. Yeah, because you can tell he's got the blue screen there. Like, there's either some guy standing there, or they've just set that little bowl on a thing. Sort of, I, I combat with the idea of the Daleks owning slaves, um, because I think it sort of goes against their MO, um, because they're all about the ex total extermination of everything else. So when the Daleks specifically take on slaves to deal with the labor for them, it's like, is that something they'd really do, or would they just kill shit? Because uh, killing shit is what they do. Um, but I do think it makes sense. Uh, I think, um, God, I was, I was fucking thinking about something right there. I think, I think it does make sense for them to not want to carry out all the manual labor. And here we are, a, a sting, which is actually, um, it's going to be interesting, especially in the next episode here, uh, where we figure out that there are actually, there's a frozen army of 10,000 Daleks on this planet. And the way they implement that into the story is very interesting, and it's implemented much better than the invisibility scheme. Um... So yeah, that was uh, episode two, Planet of the Daleks. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, so one of my favorite uh, Dalek stories, and it's more of a guilty pleasure or anything, because I know there's a massive slew of problems with it, but um, I don't think it's too terrible, uh, and I think it is quite underrated. But I'll see you guys in the next one.